good evening, everyone. Uh, so my name is Ibrahim, and today I'll talk about like m move fast and secure things. Uh, so let's start with the introduction uh, about me. So I work for Facebook for uh, slightly more than two years in the product security team, uh, where we try to uh, detect, uh, fix, and prevent security bugs in the team. Uh, before Facebook, I used to work as a security consultant. So I used to do pen testing, red teaming, and security code reviews, uh, more on the breaker side, uh, where I can uh, break things. Uh, I love CTFs, and I do play a lot of CTFs. Uh, I play part of a team called LCBC. So if you play CTFs, you'll probably uh, be familiar with the name. Uh, I also. I love server-side bugs, so I love breaking things from the server side. Uh, and more than that, I love automating these things, like how can I find them always uh, in an automated uh, way. Uh, last thing is my handle on Twitter. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions about, the of, about this uh, presentation. Uh, so the agenda for today. So we will have, uh, so the talk today will be split into two, two parts. The first part is understanding the scene of how as the product security team tried to protect Facebook, the code base, the huge code base uh, of Facebook and the different applications that we have and how the product security team tackle this. So we try to kind of set the scene, how everything works, how developers work, and the different uh, uh, ways we use to, to, to protect Facebook. And then the second part of the presentation would be like a deep dive on how static analysis help us to reach that goal of securing uh, Facebook. And we'll have some slides about myth busting, about static analysis, and we'll end up with a very, very, very simple uh, demo uh, for something interesting. Hopefully it works. Uh, so if we want to secure Facebook, we need to understand more about the environment in Facebook. So security engineers or defenders inside Facebook, uh, they want to secure the code that is written by software engineers. Uh, so in order to solve this problem or to tackle this problem correctly, we need to understand how quick software engineers write code and how uh, the amount of code that is being written. Uh, whether you are in Facebook or in a company, you would need to understand if you have one software engineer, then even like one security engineer would be enough. You look at the, all the code they write, even if you look at that manually, problem solved, hopefully no, no security bugs there. Uh, but for a company with the size of Facebook or similar companies, so when you look at the numbers, so first is like 100,000 K commits per week. And we're all familiar with commits. Uh, and for me, commits something that is scary or for a security person because that's a code change. Like, what are you doing? What extra code you're adding there? So imagine someone adding a feature like edit profile picture. Does this really edit a profile picture for you or for everyone? Uh, so with every code command that is extra risk that is being introduced, and we have always to, to be up to date with this. Uh, so and the number for Android pushes, like the new, the new application that we push, if you do have 34 uh, releases in 2015, now in 2019, so there's like four years before, you can imagine how these numbers would increase. Uh, but that means like three versions of Android every month. So that is, that is huge, uh, at least three versions. So that is, that is huge. Again, the code is changing rapidly. And as a security engineer, you want to adapt with this so that you can fix you can t detect bugs as quick as possible before they go to production. Uh, moving on to uh, the environment. Again, to understand how the environment works, so we have, uh, we, we try to work with software engineers so that they can ship uh, things quickly as possible. They can adapt with the community uh, whenever we have uh, the users want a new feature, they have this new feature. So that's why we have done is better than perfect. Uh, from a security person, uh, this is a bit risky because maybe that perfect part that we missed is the security bug that we are missing. But I, working at Facebook, I really love this because this is the challenge. Okay, now how can I make them move quickly in a fast way or in a, in a, in a, in a, and in a secure way? Another thing, fail harder. Uh, we have a culture where we... Uh, we don't blame people for failure because we learn from failure, whether that's from a security side or from software engineering side. But again, from a security perspective, this is a bit risky. So how can we help them uh, fix this? Uh, and how can we make this failure uh, not something that affects our users or the privacy of our users? Uh, some uh, stay focused and keep shipping. So here's some kind of uh, rationale. It's like, OK, let's stay focused and keep shipping things. One important part is that nothing at Facebook is somebody's problem. So we see. This, the culture and the dynamics of the culture, the culture poses some risk from a security perspective. Uh, software engineers are moving too quick. They are uh, creating uh, 
new, new, new products every day. And from a security perspective, we want to adapt with them. We want to move as quick as, as them and to catch things that might, might introduce uh, security, security issues. Uh, so how do we secure the code base at Facebook? So we have these four uh, like pillars or four uh, points that we try to focus on. Secure, secure framework, security reviews, and automation. I'll speak of everyone uh, briefly with like the limitations and uh, the pros and cons of everyone. And then we will deep dive into how static analysis and automation uh, helps us secure the company. So secure framework. They are very, very cool. I love secure frameworks, XHP, Django, everything. They solve problems from the root. Like they, they clear classes of bugs. X, uh, so XHP and Hack helped us on Facebook to kill XSS. I don't think we have a lot of XSS on Facebook. Uh, in our bug bounty program last year, we had like one or two XSSs. And they were not straightforward XSSs. They were very, very uh, edge cases XSS, like Flash XSS or something. So they are very, very good. Django is a very good framework as well for protecting from CSRF. And again, XSS, they are very good. However, they have some limitations. A couple of things, enforcement. How do you know that the engineer are using the right API, that uh, they're not using an echo or something? You could rename it to something crazy, like echo underscore, this is risky or introduce a security bug. But this, the secure framework is, uh, secure frameworks are kind of a, a, a a model where you, you rely on software engineer uh, to use the right APIs. However, this is tricky because in a big company, uh, you might have software engineers who are, don't know the safe API, don't know the secure API. Or you can be developing something that is risky by definition. Let's say the login uh, functionality. How would you do login? How would you do rate limiting? How would you, do, uh, how would you fix the login C CSRF? So, you, you can have some edge cases where the framework doesn't, doesn't work, and that's why you have another uh, way to detect bugs. So security reviews. I love security reviews, and I think most of you love security reviews. I find this like, edge case on this API to have RCE, or edge case on XS, I broke XSS and XHP. Wow, that's great. So security reviews are great. The problem, they don't scale very well. So they are time consuming. They don't scale very well. So they, yes, some of the, we might have some bugs from frameworks, but then when we do security reviews, we, we try to find them, but look at the scale of Facebook, or if you're a very, very big company with thousands of engineers, you wouldn't scale very well. Uh, and we go to automation. So they are, they scale, they find, Low-hanging fruit bugs, so you can find like XSS, straightforward XSS and SQL injection with static analysis, and we will see this in a minute. Uh, but they also find difficult bugs, uh, fuzzing, find very, very difficult bugs, very edge cases, and like off by one, and, uh, and some heap overflows. Uh, Google have been doing great work there. Uh, one good thing about automation as well, it gives you continuous security. So it doesn't only give you, uh, security reviews are one point. So you have, at this point of time, I was confident that the product is good. Uh, but with automation, you can keep always scanning the code and running the fuzz. Oh, so they are very good. However, they have limitations as well. False positives and negatives. Uh, how you don't want to create a, uh, a, a rule in static analysis and you have tons of tons of false positives. Uh, it's also hard to get right. It's difficult to get static analysis working in a good way or like with a sane number of uh, a sane signal to noise ratio. Uh, fuzzing also difficult to get right. Uh, so. The last thing, white hat, uh, and we also use this to protect uh, Facebook or our code base. Uh, so white hat has different uh, pros and like different advantages. One of them is like continuous detection, like you have everyone in the world looking at your code and trying to find uh, bugs there. Uh, also, you have some researchers who have very, very unique talents. Like last year, we had a researcher who was uh, very focused on flash XSS. And he found some flash accesses on Facebook. The same researcher went to Google and found like top tons of flash accesses uh, on, on YouTube. So you get this uh, very unique talent, and you get continuous detection. However, they also have limitations. One of them is test in prod. So you're literally testing in prod. You push the code, and you ask White Hat to, to, to test. Also, sometimes it's expensive for small companies, if a small startup not. And by expensive, I don't only mean uh, money-wise, but uh, also the amount of effort that you would need to receive the num like huge number of reports. Also, White Hat has like 
uh, a low uh, signal to noise ratio. So I think uh, Google reported around 95% signal to noise, uh, noise to, to, to signal. So 95% of the reports are uh, bad or they don't add a value, and 5% they do add value. I think also we have around 90% or slightly above 90% uh, for that. So these are the different layers that we have. Now we'll dive a little bit deep uh, on static analysis and how static analysis works at Facebook and how it helps us uh, to, to secure things. So a little bit of uh, why did we decide to, to invest in static analysis? We have millions of lines of code. So if we have one issue uh, from, from White Hat or something, it would be very, very difficult to grip the entire code to find all variants of that issue. Uh, also, seeing the speed that we're moving in, so 100,000 commits per week, who would look into this every single commit and try to find uh, bugs there? Also, performance. So specifically static analysis, we don't have overhead uh, or runtime performance uh, similar to fuzzing. So fuzzing, you create the fuzz harness, and then you run that. You need to have uh, resources, so run that on cluster of machines, and then run for some time or affinity. And then the more it runs, the more you have coverage and try to find bugs. I'm not saying fuzzing is not good. It just like it's a different use case, and static analysis is quicker, relatively quicker uh, than fuzzing. Also, completeness and Completeness is a very, very good point. So when you do a security review, the quality of the security review depends on the reviewer. Some reviewers were with very good experience. They would say, OK, I'll cover OWASP top 10, and then I'll cover these uh, edgy cases and this framework. But then you have another reviewer have a different scale. Uh, I'll cover five of the OWASP top 10, and then I'll focus on uh, rate limiting and other things uh, maybe not there. Uh, so if you do two reviews, maybe you'll not get the same results. Some, some reviews get good results. But if you codify all the results from reviews into a tool, then when that tool runs into the code, they will always find the same results. They will always make sure that you did not miss anything. Uh, proactive and reactive. We mentioned uh, when you have a tool, so that tool uh, can run continuously on your code base. Uh, so and instead of waiting for someone to report a bug, you can find the SQL injection super quickly. You can find uh, the RCE super quick before it lands. Uh, now, our design. So OK, static analysis is good. Uh, we should invest in static analysis. Uh, it's one of our defense mechanisms. It's not the only one. And they all complement each other. What happens when we receive a bug? So whenever we receive a bug from White Hat, so either we receive a bug from White Hat or Security Review. We ask ourselves, can, do this, can we do this with static analysis? And if the answer is no, it's like, oh, oops, all right, let's think of something else. But this is like the chart for the static analysis. So if we can do that with the static analysis, and let's take, for example, SQL injection. We found a SQL injection that was reported from White Hat, and then we want to detect with the static analysis. Uh, OK, we will define this word, or like user controlled input or something from a request, and the sync is the MySQL uh, query in PHP, for example. So we will create a very simple rule show me everything from uh, the super global get to MySQL uh, query. And then we refine with Swiss. And this is a very, very, very important point. So uh, security engineers are not the best engineers to build static analysis. We are the best engineers to break code, to find bugs. And we can tell you how we, we detect this bug. But very good, so a very important point to make sure that static analysis work is that you work very, very closely uh, with software engineers who build that static analysis. Uh, so you build the norm, like the very, very straightforward rule of uh, super global get to MySQL query. And then you see thousands of results. Of course, all of them are not true positive, because that would not have this much amount of SQL injections. But then you see the first flow, the user input is casted to an end. Aha, uh -huh. we don't want to see this anymore. So you go back to software engineer. Let's, let's sanitize the flow if the user input is casted to an end. And then you reduce the number by 50%. And then you see another flow. Oh, the user input is casted to a Boolean. So this iteration between software engineers and security engineers are very, very important to have a healthy static analysis system. Once we have a rule that, yes, that looks good, and we can detect the bug, the, the, the white hat bug that we received, and the noise is good so far, then we can triage everything on master. Can we see everything that already exists now? 
in our code base? Can we see all the proper SQL injection? And from there, you can feed back again to refining with Swiss. You might find a validation function that you missed. OK, can we add this as a sanitizer? Can we make sure if the flow goes through this, then we sanitize that? Once you're good, you have good signal, let's look at diffs. So diffs at Facebook, they are code changes. When someone add a code change or piece of code uh, changing. So can we make the static analysis tool runs on diff? And it looks at every single diff and see if that diff introduces a SQL injection. If we, have, if we triaged everything on master and we can detect things in diff, then bugs are dead. We don't have the same class of bugs anymore. So this is the design that we use at Facebook to detect different uh, types of bugs. This is not very specific to Facebook. You can apply this to any company. If you can apply the same, the, the, the tricky parts is the iteration between the security engineer and the software engineers. And we'll talk about tips and guides of how this works. So tips to build a good static analysis. Coverage. Uh, this is one of the tricky parts. So what are the sources and what are the things? So super quick definition by source is something that a user controls, or if the user uh, con a, a function that returns something that a user have control of. And a sync is a dangerous function. So when you think of sources, think of what is your attack surface. Uh, let's say we are building PHP application that receive uh, an e-commerce application that receives some user input and does some transaction. So think of the attack surface. My attack surface is everything coming from get, post, and the request. So OK, should we mark the sources as the super globals, get, post, and request? Yes, that sounds reasonable. And then you can think more, but how about things that come from databases? Hmm, that's interesting. We can mark this as sources. They might affect the signal to noise ratio, but keep that in mind. So when you think of sources and you want to define sources for your static analysis tool, think of what is your attack surface. Is your attack, wh wh where, where is the attacks could come from? Usually for web applications, they are requests, get requests, post requests. In Django as well, there is an, a, an object, and you can build sources around that. Sinks. Sinks are easy, relatively straightforward to define. So uh, every sync is a new category, or you can group sinks in two categories. The os.system function or in Python, or the system API in PHP, if I have a flow from a source to system, that's RCE category. If I have uh, a source to eval, that's RCE category. If I have a source to uh, subprocess.open in Python, that's uh, uh, RCE category. And you keep scaling these uh, of, OK, what rules that I want to build. Uh, so these are sources and things. Another feedback, and this is probably for software engineers who build the static analysis, you should make sure that your static analysis is simple. It's easy to use. Your customers are security engineers. They will take your static analysis. They will iterate. They will add. They will, there should be an easy way for them to add sources and sinks and see the flows. And then, OK, I want to add sanitizers and see the flows. They would reach to a point where they might need to change something in the engine. And at, their, at this point, they will stop. So they will ping the software engineers and work closely. But the easy things, adding a source and adding a sync, running static analysis on the code base, that should be straightforward so that it gets adoption from uh, security engineers. Uh, other tips for uh, improving signal. How can I exclude uh, false positives? How can I exclude false negatives? So let's start with false positives. Uh, false positives are relatively straightforward. Uh, one is that it, every category has its own configuration. You can think of that. So a SQL injection. Uh, I'm not interested if the user input is an integer. I am not interested if the user input is uh, a Boolean or if it's an enum value, for example. I'm only interested if the user input is a string. That would affect the false positive ratio, because you now you only limit when the user input is a string and going to a SQL, uh, uh, the SQL sync, uh, my SQL query or something, similar with the RCE. Uh, false negatives are a bit tricky. So how do I find false negatives? And by false negative, it means something, it's a flow that is valid. So there is a SQL injection. The tool doesn't know about the SQL injection, and I don't know about the SQL injection. So it's like, how can I find this? Uh, there is no rule of thumb to find this, but m the things that worked with me is to fall back into a security review process. Let's grab. Let's try to find this piece or the, prop the, the, the correct SQL injection by grabbing or by doing a manual security review. If I did manage to find it, then I'll feedback this into the tool. And here also, 
uh, white hat also very, like, helps a lot because you create a rule, you have white hat, they are looking into your code base, they're trying to find SQL injection, all types of bug. Whenever you find something from white hat and you have an equivalent rule, you should chat with the software team who's building the static analysis and the security engineer why this was not detected. And you will be surprised in many cases, it might be there, but because you have a huge uh, noise, so you didn't see that uh, issue there. Uh, so that's for false negative, always fall back to grepping. Uh, feedback to framework. This is a very, very good important point. But, uh, this is applicable for companies who they control the framework that they are building. So in Facebook, we build Hack, or we're using Hack. Uh, so let's say you have your static analysis tool, and you cannot define a sync or a dangerous as an attribute in, a uh, in an object. So you want to see all the flows where a person controls a specific attribute in an object. Maybe this is difficult for the static analysis. OK, let's write a wrapper around this, a function called set uh, user admin or set admin. So, and that takes, sets the bit there. Uh, now, you can specify this function or API as your sync. So you made, you made the life easier for the static analysis tool. If you have the flexibility co to control the framework, then you can work closely with the static analysis team to say, OK, how can we avoid these false negatives? How can we make the analysis simpler for the tool so that we can detect more bugs? Last thing is speed. If your static analysis tool runs in one day, no one will use it. Security engineer will not stay one day to try something and then find a lot of false positives and then iterate over that. So make sure that your static analysis tool is quick so that everyone can use it, for, uh, or security engineers can use it. Now, for type of bugs that we detect at Facebook, so we detect many types of bugs at Facebook with static analysis, and it's, it's working very, very well. So we detect the classical ones, SQL injection, XSS, uh, and RCE, but these are not, uh, they are not super common because we have good frameworks. However, we will see in examples now. But we also detect uh, things that are very, very space Facebook specific and product specific. And when you build a static analysis home or when you can configure the static analysis in home, uh, then you can uh, tailor it to your code base. You can, make you can define things that maybe it's not a bug for another company, but for my company, this, this allows you, an unli if you're a bank, so transfer money. And if this transfer money without uh, validation or two-fact two authentication, then that would be a sync for you. You want to find all the places where you transfer money without validation or authentication. Uh, OK, now we can jump into a little bit of a technical part. So let's see how can we detect some uh, uh, patterns with the static analysis. Uh, so first, do you think this is good or bad? Anyone? So you have this piece of code. Do you think it's good or bad? And if it's bad, why? Yes? I heard yes. Is it bad? OK, how about this? <laughs> so which one is good, which one is bad? If you're building static analysis, which one do you want to detect with static analysis and don't detect with static analysis? OK, so this is a temp name. This is the name that PHP will generate for the file that is uploaded. This is not user controlled, so this is probably fine. But this is the file name, the proper file name that is passed from the user. So this is not fine from a static analysis perspective or from security perspective. So the way to define this, again, the initial rule, you would say the files, which should be your sources, and the sync is read file. This will be super noisy. But then you work with a software engineer team. No, but I don't want the temp name or anything in files. I only want the name attribute from there. And then the software engineer team might come back to you like, but, but we can't do this. But like, we can't specify the, the key or something. Then you can create a wrapper around the files up file name. And a wrapper, get, get file name, sanitize, or get real file name, something like that. So this is the real file name. And this is get user controlled file name. And then if something comes from get user controlled file name to a sync, then that's a arbitrary file read. Good? Let's go to the second one. Is this good or bad? Anyone? Please? <laughs> good? Bad? Command injection. OK. Uh, it's good. 
So this one is good because we have, so exec x is a safe version of exec. So this is not the native exec. So this is a safe version. So the framework will know s is a string, uh, and it should escape that string correctly. So if the user add a single code or like a, a semicolon, it will be escaped correctly. So this is not a bug. However, how about this? Now this is super interesting. OK, so we're executing the zip command. And there's an option called dash dash on zip dash command, which s, and that's his user controlled input. So let's see the manual. All right, the unzip command, it takes the command and executes that. So it's like a, an RCE as a service in the zip binary. Uh, this is bad, and we shouldn't have this. So you can teach the static analysis now. Again, you start off with something super simple user controlled input, which here, and again, this coming from the get request or post request, to exec x. Uh, but again, this is super noisy because it will detect this one and this one. Then you work with the, static, with the software engineering team to teach static analysis how they can parse uh, string format. So the TLDR that you want is that you want the static analysis to understand that this is a string format. And if the, the command is zip and the option is the dash dash on zip command, this should not be user controlled. And we made this succeed. And we do detect that. The interesting part here to point is completeness. If you have someone doing a security review, not all the security reviews will know that this will cause an RCE. Some of them will go read the manual, and they will know that this is RCE, but not all of them will know that this is an RCE bug. Now, if you codify this into a rule in the static analysis tool, then you detect this for free. Uh, one more thing, which is a bit tricky. Is this good or bad? Or, well, let's have both. Are both good, both bad? One good, one bad. Anyone? <laughs> OK. So here, like, we're just throwing 404 if the group ID is, not, is, is 100, which, I mean, this is not broad code. It's a sample code. But there is no security risk here. However, here there is an, a very interesting uh, case. So if the user uh, is a member of the group, so data, if he is a member, if he's not a member, we will throw a 404. So I can send a user to, a, to this page and add like image source, the URI of this page, and have on error and on load. If it's on error, this means a user in Facebook is not a group member of a specific group because I control the group ID. But if the user, the, if the response is 200, so the onload uh, attribute will run on the image tag, then the user is uh, a group member. So OK, this is a tricky flow. What is the sync here? What is the source and what is the sync? Now we want to write this in static analysis. How would you do that? Ideas? OK, so sorry. So group ID is the source. OK. And what is the sync? Maybe the HTTP 404? I mean, so a sync should take, like, we should connect the source to a sync, so it doesn't connect to the sync, right? But again, we can solve this with the static analysis team. They do, they magicians, they do something crazy and make it work. Uh, so, but if you do this, then you will get every page that takes a group ID and return 404 as a bug, which is not necessarily a bug, right? So this one is one of the most, like, the trickiest rules that we have. So you have two flows here. One is that I return to 404 that is controlled by the user, user input. That's one flow. The second flow is that this control is privacy aware. And by privacy aware, aware we mean it depends on the session of the user. So this is, you can think of this as the session of the user. So this de the, the result depends on the session of the user. And the attacker can control the 404 to 200. So there are kind of two flows here that you connect them together. If you connect them together, then you can get the results. So this is one of the trickiest rules. But we have seen, so these are different rules. We started off with a rule is like straightforward user input to the file read, and then something a bit uh, tricky with uh, string format and teaching static analysis how to understand string format. And now we have two rules connected together, or like two flows connected together. Uh, 
All right, use cases. So how, OK, now we build the rules. How do we use this in reality? Like, how, how does this work in Facebook? Like, does someone go press a button, run the static analysis, find bugs, or something like this? So we have different use cases. The first use case is like uh, regular analysis. We run continuously like every three hours, or every two hours, or every one hour, and all the code base and find the bugs. And security engineers can go like, oh, is there a new bug there? We want to triage or something. But uh, this is kind of becoming deprecated now, because no one is going to actively look at that. We want to be, do better. We want to be more proactive. When, some, when we find something bad, we push it to people rather than a pull mode. Uh, but before going that, we have like another on-demand analysis. And we use this a lot. So we received an issue from White Hat, SQL injection. All right, let's find every single SQL injection of the same type on Facebook. We received uh, RCE or, or something like, let's find every single version of that. So the, the security engineer uh, build super quick rule. They work with a static analysis team, and then they find every single piece of that, and they triage all of them and fix all of them. Uh, we also get input from security reviews as well uh, from White Hat. The, the run that I love is the diff analysis, and I really love this run. So for every diff or every code change, we run the tool before and after. Before this diff and after this diff. And then we see the changes. If this diff introduces a bug, let's say a SQL injection, it's like, oh, that's bad. No, this, this is not shipping. Let's, let's look more into this. And back to the point of helping software engineer to move fast in, sec in a secure way, that's the best thing that, that has been working. They write their code. They shouldn't be aware of security. Security should be v invisible for them. It's something that will only pop up when they do something risky. So whenever they do something risky, we can jump on. And then we can even do better, because we don't, we don't want to every security engineer to look at every single diff that introduces a security bug. So if we are very confident about the issue, then we can comment as like, uh, yeah, this is probably a SQL injection. Don't do this. And more importantly, give them alternatives. Give them a better API to use something else to use. Software engineers, they don't want to write bugs in the code, or they don't want to introduce security bugs. So give them a better alter alternative. Oh, you want to run queries or like do SQL queries? This is the right API. This is the right documentation. Read it there, and then write the secure code. Uh, some myth busting about static analysis. So one is like, does it scale? In our case, it does. So we do the analysis 20 minutes for tens of millions uh, of lines of code. Uh, which is fairly good. Uh, is it precise? Uh, well, it depends on how do you want to work with the software engineer team. The more you work with the software engineer team, improving the static analysis tool, and the more flexible the static analysis tool, it can be very, very, very precise. And we will see this in numbers in a second. Is it useful? It only finds trivial errors or like very, very straightforward low-hanging fruit bugs. We have seen three examples. None of them was super straightforward. Maybe the first one was a su super straightforward example, but the other two are tricky to find, even for a normal security review, for someone doing a normal security review. So yes, it does find complex flows. Uh, OK, the analysis dashboard. So I think uh, this is our analysis dashboard from like a year and a half ago. So the codes on the left, they are codes for security bugs. So you can think of like SQL injection XSS or something. And good signal is like how Every issue that we found, how like was it true positive, false positive? So for many categories, we have a very, very good signal. So for some categories, we have 100%. Like, no, this is a very straightforward flow. We should always be finding this with static analysis. And we do find it with the static analysis with a 100% success rate. For other flows, yes, they could be noisy, but we can work on improving them. And that's the plan, is that we work for these ones to push them up there. And if someone, if, if you have a category that has 100% success, Let's push this to auto comment. As security engineers, we don't be spending time there. We know how to detect them. We automated the process. We know what action items to take for, to help software engineers to prevent this. So let's put all this and automate the, the entire process so we can focus and invest our time in these ones that have low signal and, and, and try to, to improve them. Uh, that's the last slide. So uh, we have different static analysis tools. So we have one uh, for, for Hack, which is, uh, is not open source. But we have one for Python that we are building that is uh, open source. And it is available uh, for everyone. It's called Pyre. Uh, so have you ever heard about Pyre? No? OK, so it's in our GitHub repo. So Pyre is actually a type checker. 
so it type check Python, but it also is a thin flow analysis. Uh, so you can specify a source and a sync, and it finds you a source of a sync. And it will be, it, you can use it on any Python code. Uh, ideally, you should use it with Python 3, because if you can py, uh, type Python 3, run the type checker, and then run the static analysis tool, uh, and that will work. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, so it has the, I, I always have like a very, very small demo of Pyre, but I think I have only four minutes left, uh, so I can leave that for questions. Uh, demo would be good. Demo? I mean, it's a very simple demo, but you uh, can do it. OK. Uh, uh, all right. So let's see if we can see this. It's a very, so this code is open source, is all you can download this and try it uh, from your laptop. Uh, so let's try the type checker first. Uh, so let's see, uh, or let's actually cut. Uh, yeah, it's difficult. <laughs> yeah, so tested py. So this is a function foo that the type annotation says it returns an int, but it returns a string, and then a main calls the foo. Uh, so if you do Python 3 test, it will not complain. But if you run fire, uh, uh, then, yeah, check. It will say, uh, you have a type error. This function should return uh, an int, not uh, a string. And if you change that to, just some int value, and then you know, type the type checker again, so that should pass. So that's the type checking stuff, which is probably boring for security engineers. Uh, but let's do the, the fun stuff, the thing flow analysis. Uh, so let's open, uh, that's been bad. OK. Does everyone see the lines, or should I? Is that good? Awesome. Uh, so this is just a very, very simple program. It's called convert, uh, which reads from input image link, and then called git image, which called os.popen, and with a string format. So there is like a OS like command injection here, very straightforward. OK, how do we detect this? So uh, Pyre, you can configure Pyre to do thin flow analysis. And the way to do this, so it is in the website. Uh, and basically, you define a, a file called uh, stop stain general pizza, and then you say the type. So this, you define input. Uh, as a return a taint source of type user controlled. So that's the return value of input. And then it calls os.system. And system, the definition is that the first, uh, the first argument, which is the command, it takes a taint sync uh, remote code execution uh, category. So these categories are hard coded in, 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 in Pyre, uh, the user controlled and remote code execution. But you can define more with a configuration file. Uh, now, once you have this, uh, you can run Pyre uh, and then analyze. And that will analyze all the Python file in the, same, in the current directory. Uh, and once it do that, it, OK, I think I know what the name is. So this was commented because uh, so it doesn't understand that this is a sync. So let's uncomment this. And then run Pyre again. And here it says, on line 10, column 22, on the bad.py, uh, there is a possible shell injection because you see you read from the source, which is input to the sync, which is os.p open. And you can apply this to anything. If you have a Django application, if you have Flask application, if you have any type of application, you just need to write your own rules and it do uh, a taint flow analysis, uh, intra-procedural, and it, it's really good. Uh, that's it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. One more slide. Uh, we are hiring. So if you are interested <laughs> to work on any of our four pillars of securing Facebook, uh, we are hiring. And uh, last thing, questions. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. So um, anyone has any questions? Yay. Solution. I've got three questions. 
<laughs> one is uh, what type of analyzers you actually use as data flow, um, semantic. Mm -hmm. There are various types of analyzers that can be used in static analysis. Okay. Then I heard of uh, kind of real time static code analysis so that the developer sees the, the error while he or she types. Okay. And third is how does the vulnerability information reach the developer, reach the creator of the bug? Okay, so for the first type of what type of static analysis we use, uh, again, I'm not expert in static analysis, but I know that we use data flow analysis. We also use control flow analysis uh, because if you combine data flow with control flow, you would be able, data flow will tell you there's a bad flow. Control flow will tell you this is exploitable or this can be controlled by the user and it is exploitable. So most of the rules, they can rely on data flow, but if you can augment that with control flow, then you can get uh, this piece of information. It's like, this is exploitable, and you can augment the signal based on that. Uh, so that's for the first question. For the second question was uh, real time. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I don't think we do, like, what do you mean by real time? Like, why are they typing? Uh, no, I don't think we do this. Uh, however, we do, so once they push up a diff or like a, a code change, so we do the diff analysis. So they, fin they, fin they, they finalize their code, and then we run this, the analysis before and after, and we find the diffs. How do we surface the, the bugs to the creator of the bug? Uh, so if the bug was in the diff, we will comment on the diff on the line introducing the issue. So we say, this line is introducing the SQL injection, and here's where, where you should change. If the code is already in master, and there is no diff, then we find the owner of whoever pushed that code, and then we can like create a task or like something for them so that they can work on that. Um, any more questions? Yeah, that's one. Uh, is any of these uh, tools um, able to detect when the password is not uh, encrypted and is in plain text? Like, <laughs> is it I'm not trying to be nasty. I, I just <laughs> want to. <laughs> I'm just trying to be to be nice, not nasty. Uh, I would say, uh, so Chris Bream, <laughs> he's, uh, yeah. sorry, I can help out with this one. <laughs> um, uh, so actually, um, one of the things that, um, uh, that we discovered was that indeed you can use this kind of flow analysis to figure out where those things are. Um, and it's actually one of the components that we used as we sort of investigated um, some of the things um, that are, you know, out in the, in the public eye and uh, based off some of these articles. Because uh, one of the challenges is, finding these things at scale, right? Most companies have these things all over the place and they're just either not looking for them or not finding them. Um, and so one of the challenges of success is you start to find, as security professionals know, you start to find the things that you're like, oh, well that thing was here and now we've got to figure out what to do with it. So it's actually uh, three approaches that we use for tackling that particular problem. The first one is manual reviews. So understanding or basically looking through code, looking through data sources and of course reporting those things and allowing people an opportunity to um, give us a, you know, hey, this is happening, and then we have a, a runbook for which we can tackle that. The second one is actually through automated detection and backend data storage systems. So we have large scale data stores, um, and we have systems that can do automated detection on data types. And so we can say, like, hey, if it looks like this, then it may be that. Um, and that applies both sort of statically, sort of regular expression style, and now we're starting to pull in a little bit of machine learning to be able to improve the, the capabilities there so you can layer those on as well. The third one is actually this static analysis, which can find like uh, analysis through sources and sinks. And so um, Ibrahim mentioned uh, a couple of different tools uh, that we use um, internally. We have uh, Zonklon, which we've wrote in some blog, blog posts about that covers hack. Uh, he mentioned Pyre. Um, uh, Little uh, sort of inside inside knowledge. There's another tool that we're working on for doing uh, further analysis on the Python code base, and so we're actually using that internally as well. Hopefully, we'll be able to release that at some point. Um, so the uh, short answer to your question is yes. The long answer to your question is that is one of a number of components that we use to get better at that, and we continue to write on it as well. Answer your question. Cool. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions? Actually, I have a question for you, Maria, with another question. Okay, so um, of course you show the examples in PHP that obviously Facebook is using, and also Python, right? Obviously, um, there are challenges because of the um, the type of these languages, right? So um, the examples that you showed were um, 
uh, remote code execution, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but the question for I had specifically for Pi is there are m what we see probably the most popular vulnerability on the web at the moment is cross-site scripting, which sometimes is pretty difficult to find with all the modern templating language, JSON serialization. So can you talk a bit about how tricky cross-site scripting cases are covered? Uh, so cross-site scripting, there are like there are different cases. One, when you find them in a template language. So let's say Python, they have the template language for Python and uh, for Django. And for Django, it should be uh, XSS safe, but then sometimes people do like the type safe, uh, which is bad. Uh, so uh, Pyr, they we we don't uh, parse the template language yet, but we should be doing this uh, soon. So you can uh, mark. Uh, like if user controlled input is going to a template language and the pipe safe is used. So you can see that uh, there. You, and you, we should be able to detect this in the future. Uh, for the, uh, so uh, if you think of like template language, this is very similar to XHP. So, and we do this in XHP. So XHP is kind of template ish language for hack. Uh, so we can, so you can specify syncs and there and where. The tricky part for XSS is when it goes to JavaScript. JavaScript is difficult to do static analysis on, and JavaScript is it is difficult. Uh, so for JavaScript, I think uh, so we we rely on React, which is again uh, a framework level. It's secure by default, and we try to make the function that make XSS possible. We rename them to dangerous things so that we make the uh, uh, software developers aware. Uh, however, I think. Uh, Google are doing a very good work on this. So they have uh, strict typing. So they did type JavaScript. And they have uh, a type where uh, something called, uh, I think, uh, trusted uh, input or something like this. Uh, so if you want to uh, evaluate some code in JavaScript, that has to be of a type that is trusted input. And user type is not trusted input unless it passes through uh, a sanitization function that returns a trusted input. So from the static analysis side, I think, yes, we can do better on the template language. And we are planning to improve this uh, on, uh, on, on Python. Uh, but for the JavaScript side, from our tooling, it's limited. Uh, so uh, secure frameworks are good, and typing system is good as well. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Ibrahim. Any more questions from anyone? No? OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Brian. <laughs>